Hello, my name is John Milburn. I'm a course coordinator in environmental law. Tonight I'd like to introduce environmental law as a subject and also review chapter one of Jerry Bates' publication. It is fair to say that environmental law is a brand new branch of law, perhaps coupled with alternative dispute resolution and e-law, it represents the new face of law and a brand new topic. For that reason, environmental law is somewhat different to other more established practices or areas of law. For example, contract law is very heavily based around case law, whereas environmental law, as you'll see, is very heavily relied upon statutory law and in it laws introduced through parliament. It's about 40 years of age, uh, environmental law, so that's in extraordinarily recent and it is um, highly uh, political, it's policy driven and it is, as I mentioned, mainly the product of legislation. When I talk about legislation, I mean to contrast it to common law. Common law is effectively judge-made law and um, legislation is, of course, parliamentary-made law. The three branches of law have a lot um, of influence in the development of environmental law. By that I mean that um, the first branch, which is Parliament, and uh, the legislature uh, is responsible for enacting the legislation around which we, the environmental law is based. The second branch of the um, uh, government is the executive, and that deals with the administrative function and uh, implementation of the law in a general sense. But apart from that, it also, in the executive level, has the involvement of delegated legislation. So Parliament will, in many instances, uh, provide for delegated legislation where the executive will have the power to um, make uh, laws, essentially, through that uh, delegated process. And finally, of course, we have the third branch, which deals with case law and uh, the law of, um, of the courts. Environmental law is a little different to many other branches of law in that it is um, a regulation of process. So in that, to that degree, the executive is very important in uh, the way in which environmental law is shaped in Australia. Environmental law in Australia is all about making sure that the impacts on the natural, uh, natural environment are identified and taken into account in decision making. And that's from 1.6 in Bates. So therefore, ad environmental law is very much about administrative law in many ways. So environmental law is the process um, of regulation. And environmental law draws its content from a number of different branches of other laws. Bates makes reference to corporate liability and real property um, transactions, but it's much more than that. And I think you can uh, identify aspects of corporations law, criminal law, torts law, contract law, real property law, constitutional law, civil procedure, international law, alternative dispute resolution, and legal ethics, to name some more. Bates correctly makes the point that environmental law must rank as one of the great social revolutions of history. You see, with um, law typically, it is, is based around individual rights, whereas environmental law is really looking at the collective and making laws which are for the benefit of the community generally. Previously, before the introduction of environmental law, the responsibility for environmental degradation was laid squarely at the feet of industry, says Bates, and that's correct. Manufacturing concerns had treated air and water as a sort of natural conveyor belt to carry away all kinds of harmful effluents that could have been disposed of in less convenient or more expensive ways. And prior to the environmental revolution, there was no pressure on them to do otherwise, with one exception, and that is where individual rights had been impinged as a result of the actions of the environmental vandals, if you like. So that action was taken not because of the way in which the environment, environment had been harmed, but because individual rights had been affected. So that's the torts law that we talk about. Um, but generally speaking, um, unless someone could establish that their rights had been impinged or they'd suffered loss as a result of 
what was done in an environmental context, no action was taken uh, by the courts. And because the courts had no power uh, or no willingness, perhaps, to undertake any action against uh, what was being done in environmental uh, issues per se, legislation started to uh, become introduced about 40 years ago. So the um, litigation cycle um, was supplemented as a result of the involvement of legislation in environmental um, matters. There are, of course, those people who criticise the heavy involvement of um, judicial matters in, um, in making law generally. Um, there is that issue of judicial activism, which many of you may have heard of, and perhaps the best example of that is the Mabo decision, where the courts made the decision to effectively create law where the parliament had not done so. That didn't really happen in the context of environmental law in any, any, uh, to any great degree, however. So in environmental law, we would generally look at the parliament first, then consider the, consider the role of the executive, and then finally the, the role of the courts. There is a, another, I suppose, aspect to environmental law, and that is the merging, to some degree, of science and law. I say that because environmental law is heavily scientifically based. That's probably a natural thing to consider. But when one considers that in the context of law, one needs to consider the different ways in which people come to a decision and the different onuses or burdens of proof. Um, let me be more specific. In terms of scientists, scientists will generally consider perhaps a 95% confidence level as an appropriate criterion for probability. In law, we have two general tests. The first is the balance of probability, which is 50-50, or what we'd call the civil test or liability of liability, as opposed to the other test, which is beyond all reasonable doubt, which is the criminal test or the criminal burden. So in um, environmental law, we have a strange merger to some degree at various times of those three different burdens of proof. The other thing that's important is that we do have now specialist courts and tribunals to deal with environmental law issues. In Queensland, at the district court level, we have the Planning and Environment Court, which deals with appeal decisions, it deals with review decisions and, uh, and, it, and it deals with um, compliance issues as well. Sometimes the most effective way to deal with environmental issues is to consider the question of costs. Now I'm saying that perhaps from the context of the industry involvement in environmental law. Uh, so more specifically, can I say this, that from time to time, environmental activists will seek to change the behaviour of corporations and companies, and that may involve some degree of um, uh, peaceful non-compliance or peaceful interference. For the company, there may not be many ways to deal with that issue, but one way that they can is to uh, attack the protagonists in terms of the issue of costs so that um, the legal fees associated with a successful claim against activists may be the most um, important discouragement that they have, that is that the um, companies um, have in terms of dealing with um, the issue. All right, so we've identified in chapter number one that there are um, many pieces of law that have been introduced which will come into play in terms of dealing with environmental law. Uh, I've already indicated that the EPBCA is the most important piece of legislation in the Commonwealth jurisdiction, and you'll need to consider that, as well as dealing with the state um, jurisdictional um, legislation. That's all my comments for tonight. I look forward to seeing you in the Zoom sessions, and all the best for now.